Uh, my name is Tyree Ellison, and uh, I get to lead and serve the incredible Southland region with my lovely, amazing, wow. beautiful, radiant wife, J.L. Ellison. Yeah. And um, how about the sisters that came up here? You had, yeah. had J.L., Janae, you had Amanda, you had Patricia up here. Harmonizing together. I mean, I was supposed to be part of that song, but uh, I think I'm going to make the next practice. I'll be there, guys. I'll be there. No, but, uh, I hope you guys are having a blast. Uh, welcome again uh, to the family. Uh, the title of my lesson today is Three Days Later. Come on, sorry. Come on. Three Days Later. And you may wonder why the number three. A lot of us are familiar with the resurrection. Jesus came to earth, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for you and I sinned and resurrected three days later. Right. But why three? Why three? God, who's powerful and all, knowing could have chose any number. He could have chose two. Mm -hmm. I mean, two are better than one, right? Seven. <laughs> right. He could have chose twelve. I mean, he had twelve apostles. Yeah. But he chose three. Oh, you know that phrase three days later is, is literally kind of shown throughout the Bible. Mm -hmm. That concept, if you will. I mean, we know Jesus constantly is telling his guys, hey, I'm going to resurrect in three days. And you have to tell them repeatedly because the, the first and second time, the third time, sometimes you just don't get it just yet. You know, sometimes you need to be reminded multiple times. In Luke 2, 46, it says, after three days, Jesus was found in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening, asking questions when he was a boy at the age of 12. In Matthew 12, 38, verses 38 through 40, it speaks about just as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, it was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So would the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. I mean, even in the Old Testament, in Joshua 3, 2, it says three days later, Joshua will, will rally his men and they will set camp and get ready to go into the promised land. In Nehemiah 2, 11, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem, but three days later, he examined the walls. Why three? Well, the number three, biblically, it represents completeness. Come on, bro. It, you think about the Trinity, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead. It's the complete form of who God is. Yeah, He's on. one. Similar to water. I mean, a lot of us are familiar with water, kind of put it in our everyday understanding today. Take water. You have three kind of, if you will, you know, states of water. You have the liquid form, yep. you have the solid, and you have the, the gas form. Uh -oh. But you don't call it dirt. You call it water still. Right? right. No matter whether it's rain, no matter whether it's ice, no matter if it's a water vapor, right. it's all the same substance, which is water. Come on, Tyree. In the same sense, when it comes to God, he's one. Amen. And it's complete. It's three. And the Bible shows this complete form of who God is, and we know without a shadow of a doubt, it happens at the resurrection. Right. Because that's when God shows himself divine, shows himself God in the flesh, Jesus, right? Yeah. Shows himself God in the flesh and resurrects three days later. Yeah. However, on the flip side, on a, you like that? On the flip side, okay. scriptures also teach that Satan, when you want to do good, Evil is right there. Wow. And so Satan is working through the details as well three days later. In Genesis 34, 25, three days later, Simeon and Levi, who were descendants of Israel, deceived the Shechemites and to believe they would be a part of their family because of circumcision. And at that time in the Old Testament, due to circumcision, they would set you apart whether you're a person of God or not. And so instead what they did, they lied to him. And then they had every man in the city killed with the sword. Oh, wow. And so really what they did, they paid back evil for evil, which doesn't make it right, right? No. It doesn't make it right. No. In 1 Kings 12, 12, during the days of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, it says three days later, he rejected the godly wisdom of the elders. Sometimes those young folks just don't get it. And so he rejected the, the, the wisdom of the elders, and he began to oppress the people. And sadly, this king, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, lost the kingdom. Yeah. It split at that time. And not just that, God's people, rather than worshiping God, they end up worshiping false gods of yeah. the world. Mm -hmm. In Joshua 9, 16, it says three days later, Joshua 
relied on himself rather than relying on God as he, as he, as he normally does. This, this split second, he just, you know what? I think I got this. Oops. And he relies on himself, and he led to be deceived by the Gibbonites. Mm. Check it out. And so it, it shows you a great illustration. Sometimes when we rely on our own understanding and not relying on God, we make some bonehead mistakes. Three days later. And you see this throughout the whole entire Bible. This cosmic battle between good and evil, light and darkness, Satan and God. Yeah. And it's two different, very much different paths, but however, we're all called to make one choice. Amen. Come on, bro. Here's the choice. Either you would choose Satan or you would choose God. Come on. And so this morning, I only have two points for you guys. Yeah. Point number one, the power of Satan, or point number two, the power of God. Hey. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. And we look up here in the book of Matthew. It's also known as the Synoptic Gospel. You know, and, and it was the Synoptic Gospel very much similar like to Mark and Luke, which basically just detailed the same accounts of Jesus' life. Yeah. Right? And we see here, my first point, the power of Satan. And we see Satan working through the details. Look at here, Matthew 27. We'll pick it up here at verse 38. Say amen when you have it. In verse 30, it says, Two rebels were crucified with him, him meaning Jesus. It says, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said. But he can't save himself? He's the king of Israel? Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him then. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. Now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heat insults on him. And we'll pause here. Yeah. Sure. The power of Satan. We see the first power of Satan here is that right here, he's hurling insults. He's mocking Jesus to really get him off the cross. And by this time, Jesus would endure so much throughout the night. I mean, he would have been already flawed, exhausted, beaten, bruised, right. slapped, spit in his face, on, bro. even jumped by other men. And why experiencing all of this? Jesus endured on the cross. Yeah. He stayed up on the cross. Amen. Because Jesus knew on the cross is when you and I's sins will be forgiven. Amen. And here we see why Jesus is on, on his way doing good. Satan is right there as well. Right. And Satan, what he was doing, he was influencing the people around him. He was influencing, the, the, out of all the people, the religious leaders. Out of all the people you think you get the most support from other fellow brethren or, or, or sisters in, 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 the, in the kingdom or in, the, in Christ. But yet his very own people caused him to be on the cross. Yeah. Come on, sorry. They hated him. They mocked him. They insulted him. Yeah. And, they, and, they, and they were like, hey, just get off the cross, Jesus. Hey, you, you say you're a son of God? Look it up. And then I'll believe you. Yeah. Just imagine this for a second. If Jesus... Decided to compromise his convictions right there. Wow. Man, we'll be in a lot of trouble today. Yeah. We'll be in a lot of trouble. Come on, bro. You know, in scripture it says in Luke 9, verse 23, that Jesus himself says it. He says, hey, deny yourself and carry your cross daily and then come follow me. Right. Show yourself to be my disciple, right? Oh, bro. Disciples, another word for disciple, it means Christian. Yeah. And so we understand that Jesus is the epitome of what it means to be a follower of God. He sets the example blamelessly. And he calls us, you and I, this morning to do likewise. Yeah, come on. And Jesus, we see from the scriptures that he's carrying his cross and he's dying on it. But then, yeah, we know the story, he resurrects three days later. But yet at the same time, we still see Satan working between the details, trying to get Jesus to compromise and get off the cross. Yeah. 
You know, oftentimes we think Satan is just going to work the very obvious way. Like he's just going to take somebody out like this. This, this, this is way too easy. Yeah. Satan could. I mean, it's the power of Satan we talk about right here, right? You totally can. But oftentimes we forget that Satan, he's been doing this for years. Yeah. That's too easy. Yeah. That's too obvious. Right. He's the king of the seat. He's, he's, he knows what he's doing. He's, he's good at it. Yeah. Just like we're in this room looking good on our Sunday fest. And sitting here, Satan is in, in, this, in this room having Sunday service as well. You follow me? Right. Come on, bro. And, and the way Satan works sometimes that we can forget is that he worked very subtle. Right. Right. Bro. Very subtle. Not the obvious. He's like, you know what? If I could get this person just to compromise a little bit over here, mm -hmm. and if I could get them to compromise just a little bit over there, but what happens when you start to build that habit of compromising little by little, yeah. over a period of time, little by little, little by little, little by little, and this, you know, you find yourself far away from God. Wow, so true. So far away. It's scary. Yeah. It can happen like this. Yeah. And so we see, you know, Satan is like, hey, you can even go to church. Hey, you see the Bible? Read it. It's awesome. Hey, everyone loves prayer. Hey, sometimes we say, hey, pray for me. Hey, pray to your blue in the face. Ooh. However, just don't obey it. Mm. Do everything else, just don't obey it. Yeah. Come on, bro. Hey, you don't, you don't actually have to live like Jesus. Mm. Hey, you don't really got to take this Christianity thing that serious, do you? Right. You don't have to put it above your family. Do you? You don't. So Satan just whispering these lies. Wow. Thanks. Hey, you gonna actually numb out from the pain. Don't don't feel it. Hey, do what I do. Let's numb out to it. Yeah. It's okay to compromise. Just just one more time. Just give me one more time. Wow. And sadly, this lie has led a lot of people astray. Right. Even in the church. That's why the scripture is so obvious and so clear. It says, hey, to not. Give Satan a foothold. Because right. when you give him a foothold just a little bit, right. he'll take more and more and more. And next thing you know, he climbs up to your neck and he's choking you out spiritually. Wow. wow. Come on, Terry. Come on, Terry. And what we can learn from here from the scripture is that we learn from Jesus and his example is that we need to stay on the cross. Yeah. Come on. And we need to continue to carry our cross. Come on, babe. Because even when it hurts, just like Jesus in this moment right now hurting, he stayed committed to the will of God. Man. Let's keep reading. Let's look at Matthew 27. Oh, I'm going to fast forward a little bit again. Just look at that Satan working through the details. Look at verse 62. Come on, bro. The power of Satan. It says the next day, the one after preparation day. So this is day two. The chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than a first. Take the guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. The second power of Satan that he uses here is to hide and cover up mm. the truth. Mm. Okay. Come on, I follow we know the truth. Like, we know that Jesus is actually going to resurrect from the dead. And the, and the, the religious leaders remember that. It's like, hey, he's, he's, he's in a tomb now because it's day two. Right? He died on a Friday, and it's day two now. This is the Sabbath day, after the day of preparation. And he's like, hey, I remember he, he said that he's going to resurrect on the third day. Hey. And so what they do, they encourage Pilate, who was the governor of Rome at this time. And at this time, Rome is like the mega power. They're like the superpower of the world. Yeah. What's that? They're like the warriors when they were undefeated. Oh, come ah. on. Ah. They're like the 90s bulls. Yeah. They're like the Lakers when he had Kobe Bryant. Amen. <laughs> They're nothing to be messed with, is what I'm saying. Come on. But yet, what does Satan do to influence him? He, he, he covers up the truth. Amen. We know that Jesus is going to resurrect on the third day. But what do they do? Hey, he, he gets Pilate, and Pilate, what he does, he sends his guys to put a seal on Now, the Roman seal at this time was, was pretty much a, a little stamp. It was like, hey, don't mess with this. <coughs> if you mess with it, I'll kill you. Because Romans, they were, they, were, they, were, yeah, yeah. they were the mega powers at the time. 
But then I just that they put a guard there. And, and, and again, the Roman soldiers were very, like, skilled. I mean, they, they, they got crucifixion down to a T. It came from the Persians, but they just learned that skill, and it was, it was effective. And the way they did it was very gruesome. And so they post a guard there, and typically the guard just like, hey, he's there. And they understood there's this creed, like, hey, if you mess up just a little bit, you're dead as well. So just to think about out of all nights, how more attentive this soldier would have to be on a night then that Jesus was in the tomb. Yep. And he got a guard. It's like, I ain't going to sleep this time. Like, I ain't messing around. Because his livelihood depended on it. You follow? Yeah. Let's keep reading. Look at Matthew 28. Come on, bro. Verse 11. So at this point in context, he resurrects. But again, look at Satan still working through the details. Even after the resurrection. In verse 11, it says, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you have to say to his disciples, came during the night and stole them away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. We'll pause here. We've seen Satan insulting and mocking Jesus to get him to come off the cross. We've also seen Satan trying to cover up the truth. The third power we see here is Satan using the power of deceit. What's deceit? Deceit is just a misrepresentation of truth. Like, how do you tell something is counterfeit? Well, it appears real. Right. Right? It's deceitful. The counterfeit dollar, it looks real until you actually use it. You realize you can't use it because it's fake. Right. Right? And so here's the third day. Jesus already resurrected, and you still see Satan trying to mislead the people. And the scripture teaches that even the chief priests had a hand in it still. Again, the religious people were so far away from God that these guys took the money, gave it to the soldiers to just silence them. Just like, hey, don't, don't say nothing. Just shut up. Be quiet. Everything will be okay. It's going to be all right. Just don't say nothing. And yet, some of the people during that time either may have heard of the gospel, but some think about the potential people who would have had a chance right. that did not get a chance to mm-hmm. because they were deceived so wow. by the lie. Mm-hmm. And we know this to be the case because all throughout the Bible, you see this. When good is there, guess what? Evil is right there crouching at your door. You see this even in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. You see this all the way since the beginning of a Cain and Abel story. That when you want to do good, evil is right there crouching on, bro. at your door. Oh and why? Why is this the case? Why? Yeah. Well, in Revelation 12, it says that Satan, the devil, was hurled down from heaven. And he tries to lead the whole world astray. He is ticked off that we're worshiping God here this morning. Come on, no. He wants to send you to hell. And it says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, it says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. So the, 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 the picture that you think of Satan on, on a Halloween and with the horns is, is a lie. Right. And the Bible says he masquerades as an angel of light. Why? It's deceitful. Yeah. Yeah. It, makes it, it makes it appear as if it's real, but it's really it's an illusion. Even in the book of Job, Satan is roaming to and from, looking for someone he just can devour, right. he, can, he can lead us straight, and, right. and, and make sure that they don't get an opportunity with God. Come right. on, bro. Come on, bro. This is sadly the world we live in, even to this day. Because Satan's still roaming. Because yeah. now we have a lot of people who rather just be religious rather than righteous. Yeah. We have a lot of people who rather just be spiritual and not have the Holy Spirit. Oh, right. We'd rather have a lot of people who put up with the lie rather than change from the actual truth of the scriptures. Come on, come on. You know, I think about our brother Caleb Cohen, who once said, just because it sounds like doctrine, doesn't mean it's sound doctrine. Wow. 
just because it sounds like doctrine doesn't mean it's sound doctrine. Yeah. Implying what? Sometimes you, you just wanna you just wanna hear what sounds good, but guess what? It doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. We live in a culture and in a society that hey, everything that's organic is good for you, right? The fruit is organic. Just put the label on it. It's organic. Must be good. Right. But guess what? Everything organic is not good for you. <laughs> guess what? Tornadoes are organic. You want to get hit by one of those? <laughs> no. It's time for us to start asking questions. Come on. And stop believing the fallacies of the lies of the world and start putting our minds and our faith in the Bible and with me. You know, this is a documentary on Netflix. Sometimes I like to watch my movies here and there. You know, I have some free time. But uh, just spoiler alert, but it's this movie uh, on Netflix that, that I guess used to be there. It might still be on mine because, you know, you got added to the list. Yeah. <laughs> so she can watch it for later. And so it's this movie called Operation Varsity Blues, the college admissions scandal. Nice. And really what it was, it was just documenting this guy who would basically try to finesse the system. He was trying to, like, manipulate the system, basically, right? And uh, he would work with all of these prominent people, these rich and famous people, to really try to help them get their kids into top-notch schools around the nation. The Ivy League schools, the Stanfords, the USC's, the Berkeley's, the UCLA's, all these top-name schools that people kind of like, like rah-rah about, right? Because it's, it's prestigious. Right. And in the movie, it talks about these schools having more of a commodity and more of a status and more of a bragging rights rather than the sole basis of what it should be all about, which is an education. Right. It's starting to be about the wrong things now. And then all the parents are feeling so pressured, like, well, your, your kid go to that school? Okay, how do I get my kid into this school so then I can also be a part of that conversation? How do I get my kid into this school so they can have an identity? Because guess what? If they go to this school, maybe they'll be somebody. Maybe they'll be successful. Maybe someone will take them seriously. And guess what? We fall for it. Come on, bro. Now, the crazy thing of this, the biggest thing I took away from this uh, movie is that some of us are familiar with the college rankings when it comes to schools, right? They, they call it the U.S. News and World Report. And they rank schools every single year, like the top schools, the top tens, based on certain like criteria. However, this all started in the 80s. And they, and they started this, and they based it on one criteria, one criteria only. Prestige. Wow. Prestige. Think about it for a second. And that's the word we use a lot of times in our institutions. Uh, it's, it's very prestigious. It's, it's, oh. <laughs> it's very prestigious. And it's, it's like a buzzword. It's almost like the word innovation sometimes. Like, it's innovative. <laughs> but is it really innovative? <laughs> is it really that new? You know what I mean? Like, or is it just something that, that's happened underneath the sun? You know, and this word prestige, it's just everywhere, it's become a buzzword. But here's the thing, spoiler alert. The word prestige is just a French word for deceit. Oh, sorry. It's just a French word for deceit. It means what? It's an illusion. Wow. It's an imaginary thing. It's a perception. Come on, Tyree. And guess what? Satan so does that lie. Wow. And I'm... You know, and I like to believe that we are good-hearted people, but I think for some of us, even in this room, we believe in that lie. And it feels good to us. Like, man, like, I'll chase after it. I'm going to make something out of myself. It's prestigious, but guess what? It's the sea. Yeah. Wow. To be honest, even on our college campuses right now, roughly one out of four women are either sexually harassed or raped or abused in some way or form. And that's only the ones that report it. Right. Only the ones that report it. And as men, we, we love to be tough and love to be macho because we got to protect the image or whatever it may be. A lot of men maybe don't report it, but guess what? It's no different for the men. Come on, bro. You know, there's this German philosopher named Friedrich Nietzsche. I was practicing this all week, so I think no, I got it no, down. Yeah. And he once said, sometimes people don't want to hear the truth because they want their illusions destroyed. He says, sometimes people don't want to hear the truth because they don't want their illusions destroyed. Wow. Which one are you this morning? Mm. Are you someone who wants to believe in the truth wholeheartedly and accept it? They can actually change your life. Or you're going to be the one that believes in the lies because you're trying to protect your image and not destroy the illusion that you have for your very self. Come on, Tyree. 
You know, the Bible tells us to take captive our thoughts and make them obedient to Christ, that we're going to have the power in Christ to demolish every type of argument that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And so I'm going to challenge us as a family, as friends, as, uh, as, as maybe your first time coming out. I want to challenge you to study the Bible. Come on, bro. Get with the person that invited you out and study the Bible. Learn what it truly means to be a real disciple. Because only then, only then do you have the actual power to be removed from the power of Satan. Amen. Come on, bro. And for some of us who's been around a while, Come on. I want to call us to repent, change our way of thinking, Make our thoughts, take them captive, and make them obedient to the Bible. Amen? Amen. Come on, come on, bro. Point number two, the power of God. Let's go back to Matthew 27. And we'll pick it up here in verse 45. And so we know Satan. We set that up like Satan is working through the scenes and he's working in the details. However, God is still in control. God is triumphant. He's still in control of the whole situation. And we pick it up here in Matthew 27. Beginning at verse 45. It says, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shamatani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got out of a, got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out and again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When a satyrian and those with them who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Amen. The power of God. <laughs> the power of God here, the power of Jesus we see here is shown to us. Through his faithfulness. Because here in the scriptures, we see Jesus on the cross. He's in agony. He's in pain. And he's suffering. Stuff that we can't even imagine. Like, have no, like we can't even compare to that, what Jesus went through. Right. And he recites in scripture, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you look at your footnote for some Bibles, it, 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 it's scripture he's reciting. And it's the scripture that he's reciting from the 22nd Psalm. And it actually was a psalm that was written by King David during his day and age. Yeah, right. And he was the king of his day and age. And guess what? The enemies want to take him out. Mm -hmm. And so David was crying out to God, my God, my God, why are you forsaken? Feeling like, God, where are you? Right. The enemies want to take me out. There's so much happening in my life. Yeah. But yet, in that psalm, when you keep reading it, Psalm 22, yeah. you'll see that God actually delivers Amen. when you put your trust in God. And we see Jesus' heart could have been on a pain. Jesus' heart could have been on other things. He could have been focused on himself, yet he was focused on you. Wow. And we see that Jesus had the same heart like David. David is known after men of God's own heart. How much more for the Son of God? That just like this song, my God, my God, we're every forsaken. But Jesus, at the end of the story, he knows that God delivers him yeah. because of his faithfulness to God. You know, that only God can save us from our pain. Wow. Only God can deliver us from that pain. Let's keep reading here at Matthew 28. We pick it up here in verse 1. It says, after the Sabbath, meaning this is the third day, it says, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a body earthquake. Man, there was another earthquake. <laughs> For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. 
For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Amen. Amen. Come on. He has risen. The power of God. We see the power of God working here. That God, just like his word says, he delivered him from the powers of sin. He delivered him from darkness and stuff. He delivered him from the power of Satan. Because only with God can you truly be saved. Three days later, you see the fullness, the completeness of God working powerfully. Come on, bro. Jesus carried the cross, and at this time, the cross had all types of bad representation. I mean, with someone who was on the cross, it was, like, it was like them going to death row. Put it in our day and age, right? It, there was a condemnation. It was this, this shame that people would feel when they carried the cross because it was only meant for criminals. But yet, Jesus scorned the shame on the cross like it talks about in Hebrews. It showed the power of God by resurrecting from the dead. The scriptures show the power of God and it's so powerful that the fact that the, the, the whole earth shook. We live in California, like, if an earthquake happened, we do this all the time in school, sometimes from a, from a young age, they teach you these earthquake drills. But we don't really kind of follow them when they happen, you know, we just kind of like, did you feel that? <laughs> but it is too late. But just imagine that for a second, the whole room shakes. And not just the whole room, but the whole Southland shakes, the whole LA county shakes. The whole California shakes. The whole world is shaking. Wow. The power of God. Amen. And it shakes to the point where God displays this power. He's like, you see all through here some crazy stuff happening. People rising from the dead. Holy people. It could have, some scholars believe it could have been the prophets. I don't know so much about it. The only thing I can do is take the scriptures for what it says. Right. I can go off that. It was holy people rising from the dead. Yeah. That's kind of scary though, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but here again, only God can raise the dead. We think about the story of Lazarus, only God can do such things. Again, the power of God. Amen. Come on. And it just don't shake once, it shakes twice. Sean is very important. Almost like when, when God says people name twice in the Bible, like, hey, right. Martha, Martha, why are you so worried? You know, it's, it's, some, it's an important thing God is trying to get across here. Yeah. But guess what? He's still in control. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not Satan. Not us, God. Because he's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And we see from the scripture, the first time the earth shakes, it says the curtain of the temple was ripped from top to bottom, showing that it was from God. Amen. But also back then in the Old Testament, the Jews, the way they worshiped God was inside the temples. And so they, they had these priests, and only the priests could go inside at times, and they would offer these animal sacrifices, storm blood, splash of blood on the wall, just to atone people's sins. And they had this curtain that, that was represented, you know, to, 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 to split the holy space from the most holy space. And the color would be blue. It would be purple. It would be scarlet red. Indicate what? Yeah. Exactly how Jesus looked on the cross. Yeah. Scarlet yeah. red. Yeah. Because of his blood. Bruised with the purple and blue. Right. From the flocking. And yet... The cool thing about this is that in Hebrews 10, 20, it says that this curtain was Jesus. And so that, that split from top to bottom was to represent Jesus. And because of Jesus and through Jesus, we now get to have access to the most holy place, which is God, our Savior. Amen. And in Hebrews 9, 15, it goes a little bit further because back then it was the old covenant. Remember, there were slashing animals, all these different things, the, 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 the lamb. Thank God we don't have to do that nonsense now. That would be so scary. Y'all just come up here, just have a land, just pow. <laughs> Who got sin? <laughs> that would be scary. Some of you guys be that come back. <laughs> but thank God for serving as the ultimate, ultimate sacrifice. In Hebrews 9.15, it talks about, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. That those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Amen. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from sins committed under the first covenant. So it had to happen. And understand, Jesus knew this would have to happen so that you and I could actually have a true relationship now with God. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, 
But here's the thing. What did this message mean to the people in Jesus' time? What did it do to the people of Jesus' time? Let's go over to Acts chapter 2. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Acts chapter 2. As some of the, 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 the apostles fled from Jesus at the scene, but then when they see the resurrection, they were, they were fired up. Their faith got stronger. They're like, wow, he's actually the Messiah. And now is the time of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And this was this big festival. It would be like this big parade where all the people are coming to the, the city of Jerusalem to worship. Right. And, to, and to, to be jubilant, to have joy, to remember what God has done. And it's 50 days after the Passover. Right. So all we remember from the Passover time to the times of Moses when the, 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 the angel would go across the doors. And if you didn't have the blood of the lamb on the door frames, guess what? Your firstborn would be dead. But if you have the blood over the door, friend, guess what? The spirit will go right past in their spirit of life. And here, the day of Pentecost, we pick it up here. What was the message and what was their response? Come on, bro. Acts 2, verse 36. It says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. It said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Amen. The resurrection had a powerful effect on the people during that day. Yeah. To the point where they, they realized, man, they were cut to the heart because they sin is what literally put Jesus on the cross. And so they wanted to do something about it. It's like, man, how do I make this right? The standard was just very clear. I mean, Peter just told him, like, hey, you need to repent. Yeah. Meaning, guess what? You have to have your change of mind. You have to change your life. You no longer live for yourself, but now you live for God. Come on. Be a disciple. Get baptized as a disciple. And this is what we see here. 3,000 accepted that message and got saved. Just imagine that 3,000 come up here today and get saved. That would be the power of God on you. Yeah. But here's the thing. It was just too few people. Scholars believe at this time it was millions of people. And it just goes to show you the truth that though a lot of people talk about Christianity, like the life of Christianity, but don't want to carry their cross like the Christianity of the Bible calls them right. to do. Right. Here, you don't see these guys going back home. No, they stayed in Jerusalem. Why? Because the kingdom was there. The church was there. Right. You see the same conversion. That's important. It wasn't like, hey, I think I was saved over here and I... And now, actually, I was saying over here, then this person thought they were saying, no, they have the same conversion. Right. They have faith, they repented, and they got baptized for the forgiveness of their Amen. sins. Amen. And then they have the Holy Spirit. Right. And these guys we talk about to this day, they literally changed the world. Yeah. Literally changed the world. They named cities after these guys. Some of our institutions have influence from people from the Bible. Why? Because they understood the message. It created a catharsis in your heart to want to change and do something about it. Right. But that was the first century. What would the message of God be for us in the 21st century? Let's go over to 2 Corinthians. Come on, bro. Let's go, Tyree. Let's go, Tyree. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We pick it up here. Come on. We pick it up. Verse 14 it says, For Christ's love compels us. Because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Yes. This word compels means to force. It's not me forcing you. It's the Bible. It's God forcing you to be right with God. Come on. And it's Christ's love that compels us. It's Christ's love that forces us to no longer live for ourselves, but for who? God. Yeah. It's the power of God. It's the reason why we raise special missions, as our dear sister Charlotte did very oh, Charlotte. a great job sharing our heart yeah, yeah. of why she give back to God. Why? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't mean much. If being caught up with the world, like only thing that matters 
is us having a relationship with God. Right. right. And because Jesus died on our cross for our sins, guess what? We raise special missions. Right. So other people can have what you and I have, which is a relationship with God that can save them and send them to heaven. Amen? Right. This is why we share our faith. This is why we deny ourselves and say no. It's hard to say no. I don't want to say no. I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> we all do. You hear me? I want to do what I want to do. But this is why we deny ourselves and say no. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross. Right. This is why we come from all the far from Southland, as far as like, like close to Long Beach for some of us, as far as all the way to Inglewood, to come all the way back east, which is over here near Compton. Sweet. Come on. Like, come on. <laughs> from Sweden for some. <laughs> why? Because Jesus died on a cross. Amen. This would be the same call that the Bible would have for you and I today in the 21st century. Yeah. Come on, bro. But here's the thing. We act like it's a bad thing. This is the glory of God. Right. That we're imitating the men and women of that time because guess what? They carried their crosses. And guess what? Many of them died on it. So what's the call for us too? To carry our cross and be willing to die. Amen. A lot of us want Christianity the easy way without the cross. Right. I mean, I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. You know? <laughs> it's not there. A lot of us want the crown of heaven without the cross. It's not, you're not going to get it that way. Because guess what? No cross, no crown. No cross, no crown. And we sold this world, I mean, from the world, we sold this lie like as if the Bible is a bad thing. It's the most greatest thing ever. We still talk about it to this day. It's the reason why you're here. <laughs> it's the reason why we're here on the Easter Sunday worshiping God. Are you with me? It's because Jesus died on the cross and resurrected. Why is this so important? You know, just this, um, these stats, of this, this, this research think tank. And they're doing these stats of basically just want to see um, the state of the world. And they want to see like which countries are actually at peace with one another. And so they do this study and they cover 162 countries, right? And from the study they found out only 11 were not not involved in any form of conflict. That's weird. So I don't really, I don't really, I'm not that really good at math, but I'm gonna try here, right? So 162 countries minus 11, that's what? 151. I had to look a little bit. So that means what? 151 out of 162, that's over 90% of countries in this world is at some form of conflict with one another. Wow. And that's crazy. And that's not even talking about the conflict within those countries. Right. That's just one another. That's not even the, the internal strife that they have even within a country, mm. let alone within the individual themselves. Mm. The world is so subjected to the frustration of sin. But God calls us, as the children of God, as men and women of God, now we get to be those great liberators, just like the time of Jesus' time, to liberate people from the fallacies and the lies of the world to bring them to the truth that can save them. Just like the first century church, during their time, they could bring people from the fallacies and lies of the world to the truth that can save them. Just like in the 21st century, just to call for our hour to do the same thing, to evangelize the world and our generation. Are you with me? This is why we raise and do what we do. Everything we do is to save souls. Amen. We're meeting here not to just to have a good church time. Yes, it's for the resurrection, but literally to save souls. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Everything we do is to save souls. Because at the end of the day, that's what all is going to matter. Right. Us all in this room getting to heaven. Mm -hmm. But guess what? You also bring your friend, your mom, your brother, your sister along with you. Because like we shared earlier with Rico, salvation is not just meant for us, but it's meant for all mankind. And that's the call that God has for each and every one of you today. To have that relationship with God, to get right with God, and then bring that good news to others because it's the yeah. power of God. Yeah. That God can change you? That's the power of God. That God can change me? Yeah. That's the power of God. That he can take my sin and forgive it? It's the power of God. Okay. However, I think sometimes we need a heart check. Okay. And we can forget this. And this is why the resurrection day is so important. Come on. Because it helps us, again, connect back to the cross. 
It helps us, again, connect to our ultimate purpose in life. It's not just to be a student. It's not just to be a son. It's not just to be a great uh, uh, person at your job. Those things are important, yes. It's not just to be a mom. But God has given you the best title there ever is. And that's truly to be a disciple of Christ. Because guess what? That promise is not just for this life, but it's also for the life to come. You follow me? It's for the life to come. God has an incredible amount of plans for each and every one of you guys' lives, but you sell yourself so short because you only focus on now. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, bro. You know, I want to challenge us for disciples to connect back to this power of God. To connect back with the, the spirit that God has in, in, in embedded in you. Yeah. To not longer make it a, your agenda, but you get on the agenda of God to save souls oh, in this lost and dying world. And so missions is not an option. We got to blow it out. We have to blow it out. I mean, literally, people, lives in this room depends on you evangelizing the nation. You know, a couple of things we looked at today. We looked at the Satan, what Satan can do in three days. But we also looked at what God can do in three days. And we looked at two opposing forces at play. The power of Satan, but yet the power of God that should stay in control. The choice is ours tonight, or today, I'm sorry. We have a decision. For some of us, we can go out of here choosing God, and that's awesome. And some, I guarantee, will leave here as, as if I say anything and they heard nothing. Wow. And still believe in the lies. Wow. The thing is with Christianity, you can't camouflage it. It's just what it is. You can't camouflage it. You can't hide the truth. You can't cover it up. It just is. Mm -hmm. It just is. And so I want to call us as a family to make a decision. Make a decision that now, today, is going to be the day of salvation. Yes. Yeah. Stop putting off tomorrow for what you can do today by making just a decision. It's not an emotional decision. Right. It's a decision like, you know what? I want to make the Bible my standard. I want to follow with all my heart. I'm not perfect at it, but guess what? The power of God can make me a powerful man and woman that one day I will make a difference in my community. One day I will change the world. One day I will change the nation because God is with me. Are you with me? Make a decision today and do not wait three days later. I love you guys.